Welcome to the Arkansas Humanity Council's Bending Towards Justice Teacher Seminar Series. I'm Ann Clements, Education Outreach Coordinator for the Arkansas Humanities Council, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first presentation of this series, which focuses on voting rights history in Arkansas. Funding for tonight's program is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is now my honor to introduce you to our two presenters this evening, Dr. Joseph Key and Dr. Thomas DeBlack. Dr. Key is an Associate Professor of History at Arkansas State University, where he has taught since 2002. Since 2017, Dr. Key has served on the Board of Directors of the Arkansas Humanities Council and is currently serving as Board Chair. He has authored several articles on the history of early Arkansas and the native peoples of Arkansas. Dr. Key received his undergraduate degree in history from Lyon College, his master's in history from West Texas A&M University, and his PhD from the University of Arkansas in history. He will be covering the earliest history of voting in Arkansas through 1803. Following Dr. Key, Dr. Tom DeBlack will present on Arkansas's voting rights history from 1803 through present day. Dr. DeBlack recently retired after 23 years as a professor of history at Arkansas Tech University. He is a graduate of Nashville High School and holds a BA from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, an MSA from Washtenaw Baptist University, and a PhD from the University of Arkansas. Tom taught in the public schools in Arkansas for 12 years. He is a past president of the Arkansas Historical Association and the Arkansas Association of College History Teachers. He is co-author of two award-winning books, Arkansas, A Narrative History, and With Fire and Sword, Arkansas, 1861 to 1874. Tom is currently working on a book on Lakeport Plantation in Chico County and another on the Brooks-Baxter War. We are very excited to have these two incredible presenters with us uh, for this first Bending Towards Justice seminar series. Let's join Dr. Key as he discusses the earliest voting rights history in Arkansas. Different generations, different, different time periods will, um, um, excuse me, I gotta, I gotta get the, is that um and so how we sort of, how we formulate democracy in time is about those disagreements and what goes on there um and so the history of democracy often is also a history of social movements political and economic changes and about ideas uh, because those social movements and those political and economic changes really shape how we think about democracy and how it's going to develop um, and new ideas that come into to the thought about democracy as well. One last thing I think really important, one of the things that Kloppenberg says is that democracy is also best understood as a way of life. You know, we think about it, it's not just a set of political institutions. Because we can think about in this country that we have a government, we have these institutions, we have different levels of government, but we also sort of live it out all the time. And sometimes we don't even think about it. You know, we elect people to our city councils. We elect people and choose people to be on library boards. And then we select whoever's going to be the leader of that. But we also just sort of in the ideas and our discussions and have the creativity and innovation that often happens in the United States happens a lot because we're part of a certain kind of government and a certain kind of uh, society as well. You can think about that. I want to think about 19th century terms. You know, Tocqueville talked about a democratic culture in America. And what as much he talked about wasn't just about voting and the institutions you know, he talked about the people in america um and that culture that they had and that you know and sometimes it was just a culture of all people that were very chatty people who liked to disagree very opinionated all those things but living in that democracy and growing up in it by the time tocqueville's here so many of them grew up in this uh america that that was part of their way of life they didn't think about anything and didn't know anything differently uh so that's sort of to think about some of that. Also, we tend to think that the revolution's this great break between the colonial era and the new republic. <clears throat> and to some extent there is. I mean, we're breaking away from Britain, despite the fact that apparently we still love British monarchs. We have, you know, left them behind a long time ago as our leaders. But the colonial era still set up a lot of things for us. 
um, a lot of Americans began to think about self-government, began to actually practice self-government in the colonies. You know, those ideas we think about sometimes of, of salutary neglect. During that whole period of time in the colonial era, the late colonial era, that's when American colonists got the chance to really govern themselves. With Britain looking the other way, a lot of other factors coming in as well. They were also, so many of us, more of the elites, the enlightenment ideas were coming along um, and growing that time and thinking about new expressions about government, who thought about government as well. And then even before the revolution, there's a lot of popular protests in the colonies. Mm -hmm. And those things are being influenced by this, the self-government that these colonists have. So that they're becoming pretty argumentative, even in the 1740s, 1750s, just in governing themselves in many ways. Um, and some of them then pushing those new ideas. But one of the things they all came to see or was one of the ideas that they all began to believe in, that ultimately the government, their way of life was supposed to be about the common good, not just self-interest. So, you know, well, later on in the early republic, we'll often talk about people who are virtuous. And people who are virtuous are those who will do what's good for the for everyone for the government as a whole, for the nation as a whole, not just their own self-interest. So anybody, let's say, who's dying to be president, let's say, well, that person may be pushing for themselves a little bit too much and not thinking about what can I really do uh, for the nation as a whole. So by the time of the revolution, these colonists have already developed a, a culture of self-government. It's not new for them to govern themselves, to work together on that government. That's not a new thing for them. So the transition actually becomes easier for them uh, than it will in, in many countries. Um, I think that too often Americans think it's going to be go in, you overthrow a tyrannical government, you tell these people, okay, you're going to be a democracy or a republic or whatnot, and it's just overnight that's going to happen. And we know it doesn't happen that way. They don't have that culture. They don't have that history and experience for that to happen. It's going to take time. Now, we're not necessarily talking about anything like a mass democracy, and we'll, we'll get into this a, a little bit later, um, where everybody's getting to participate, of course. But in the colonies, what made things so different and why as many people are participating as there are in more than Britain and other parts of Europe is that most of the colonists, of course, are landowners. And that's the thing for so many of them. That's how you get to participate uh, in government and politics. Makes the, uh, that they're eligible to vote then and participate in this. And of course, oftentimes some of these elections, even on the colonial level, not just the local level, they're voting annually, so they're used to having constant elections and voting on something throughout all this. And so that's, you know, they're represented on the local level, they're represented on, a col on the colony-wide level, and in some cases, there may be more representation on the local level than it is colony-wide. Um, and maybe who is representing them, that may be in a more elite group even uh, than just uh, who the voters are. So they're coming to expect a popular sovereignty, a government that speaks to them, a government that listens to them and has to speak to them and has to listen to them in many cases. Now, again, we're still talking about some limitations here and limits here on uh, all this. So uh, James Otis, who's one of the great revolutionaries um, and who, you know, is the guy who also gives us the idea about taxation without representation, which becomes a great, you know, mantra of the uh, revolutionary era. He also said this, that the power of a simple democracy or the power of the, is the power of the whole over the whole. Um, and so those ideas were there, even sometimes if some of the revolutionary leaders weren't sure how they really felt about democracy. There were a lot of them who uh, were pushing more and more for that and for this this movement toward democracy. And not surprising, maybe James Otis being from Massachusetts, which is going to be one of the more radical colonies and where those ideas about self-government have been around for a long time. And of course, going along with those ideas, we know in the revolutionary era that it's also about securing rights and defending rights. And those enlightenment ideas that really start to take hold, that government's, one of its main purposes, if not the main purpose, is to protect the people's rights. You know, Jefferson says it right there, the Declaration of Independence says it right there that to secure that right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the reason for government. That is the main reason for it. 
There are ideas about equality and pluralism. How far do we take that in time? Um, that'll become sort of those aspirations for the whole nation. Um, so we have the protection of rights there. And of course, it's, you know, also talking about protection of rights means that you're limiting government. And you believe in the limitations on government. The government only goes so far and has so much power. And maybe on one level, it has some power. On another level, it may have more. But all those are kind of balanced out in time. So when they're having these regular, regular elections for the contest of these political parties or factions to control the government, everybody knows what that's about. And those factions change the colonial era and the revolutionary era. Those political parties will change uh, dramatically sometimes in their ideas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in time, and this idea about securing rights and some of these Enlightenment ideas will add into all of this universal suffrage or more of a mass democracy becomes the sort of defining for our democratic uh, nation as well. Now, as the drive for independence picks up, 1775 and 1776, we're moving from a colonial and from colonies to being states. The drive for independence has also become is caught up in a political movement really toward democracy. It's very much a, a, gra a grassroots ground up movement. The Continental Congress becomes influenced by it. Thomas Paine's common sense helps, helps fuel it in so many ways. And then it becomes about the petitions of the people that really push the Congress and the politicians toward independence. And some of them, you know, convinced by pain. And pain's common sense, so many times we think about it, it being that idea about, okay, breaking for Britain, why the king's not a good idea, all this kind of stuff. But it's also moving the discussion forward, even past. What's the government going to look like after independence? Because you've got to give people some kind of vision about it, because so many of them are terrified about what, what happens next. You know, John Dickinson, who was one of the great you know, opponents of British policy, but is so concerned, anxious about independence and opposes that to the end, really, till the day of the declaration. You know, he says, it's, we're going to be sailing off in a skiff made of paper. <laughs> well, you know, you know, what kind of government's going to, you're going to have after that then? So in some ways, Payne's trying to give us an idea about what that's going to give Americans an idea of what it's going to look like and why it's going to be better. It starts a debate about a new form of government. What is it going to be a government without a king and nobility? You got the seeds of it there. But what's next? So let's talk, you know, it paints like let's talk about a representative democracy, not just a monarchy, because it makes more common sense to have that representative democracy and not a monarchy. Yeah, and the government, of course, derives its power from the ballot not from somebody's birth. That's the basis of the government because it doesn't make any sense. What does he say that having a monarch in you know, hereditary rule, you know, well, you may have the lion so many times as the monarch, but oftentimes you get an ass for a lion instead. So there's, there's Tom there, who's of course quite the radical and revolutionary and you know, has lots of things to say about a lot of issues and a lot of the other revolutionaries are like, yeah, Tom, you need to stop talking now. So what about this grassroots democracy in a way that's, that's ignited by this common sense? I would say it's this is common sense isn't the only thing that ignites it, but that helps push it along. It kind of gives it helps give voice to a lot of what people are thinking. There are petitions from all over the colonies, from community community meetings that just are thrown together, general assemblies in the, those colonial uh, general assemblies, and they start to petition Congress and saying, "Vote for independence." There's this increasing than popular support for independence that the Congress can't ignore anymore. You know, a lot of that's going to be from New England, where, again, we're going to have more people are going to be pushing for that kind of stuff. They're used to that. But it's, it's basically a pressure campaign against Congress. The state general assembly start to make, you know, their calls for that by April of 76. North Carolina is making a call for independence. And one of the things to remember, too, that's happening in a lot of these colonies, the Continental Congress the year before had basically told these colonies, set up your own governments. 
Set up your own governments in defiance of the king. So, you know, Patrick Henry and the Virginia House of Burgers just walked down to a different building and set up shop again in defiance of their governor, the king's appointed representative. So in New England town meetings and county meetings, there were instructions that would go to their, um, um, their members of Congress and their associations um, to their colonies. Sometimes they move it on to the colonial assembly that moves it on then uh, to the Congress. Grand juries that were meeting, and sometimes we think about those as just being judicial and legal. Sometimes they could be very political. They took other actions in some colonies. They were passing resolutions to do this. And then sometimes it wasn't any sort of political organization. It wasn't any kind of elected group. It's just simply labor unions, associations, militias. You know, they're called out those volunteers. They're getting together and making those statements in favor of, of, of democracy or in favor of independence as well. And in Pennsylvania, when it's talking about the associators and the militias there, the Philadelphia Association was a very powerful uh, political group. I mean, it was sort of an extra legal, extra political group there. And so members of the Continental Congress would have known very well what that association thought because they're, you know, going out drinking with them maybe a lot of times in some of the taverns or around there eating with them. And those guys were not quiet about how they felt about things. This, these are groups and organizations that were, you know, that there's some new work being done on them, especially in Pennsylvania, that's, I think, really good showing a lot of, uh, again, democracy as a way of life, you can think about it. There's also the idea I should tell you that, you know, talking about some of the contested politics of the colonial era, like in the 1740s, 1750s, there's a big brouhaha in Pennsylvania and Benjamin Franklin, we think about the great revolutionary, the old man of the revolution, all this. Benjamin Franklin loses an election because he's on the wrong side of what the issue is there. I mean, and he is not even close. They could care less, you know, who he was because he's wrong, they think. So, so once we have, I'm going to kind of skip over the Declaration of Independence because I want to focus a lot on what's going on in these colonies now, states after the Declaration, kind of just help set us up about Arkansas and the territory there. Because we kind of know the Declaration's there. We know the, the, the great words about that. But of course, what that sets up when we declare independence is all these states now don't have any kind of governing document. They've had these colonial charters for decades, a century in some cases, and now they've got to write something new. So they start this flurry of activity to write all these new constitutions in all of these states. John Adams, who's such a leader in the Continental Congress, for the most part, writes the Constitution of Massachusetts. I mean, a lot of these guys in the Congress went back home and did this or sent these ideas back home in their constitutions. The interesting thing is, Adams starts off with Constitution not with sort of a framework of government, but he starts it off with a Declaration of Rights. So that's going to be that and the other state constitutions, that Declaration of Rights that they will all include will be basically a model for the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights. So, of course, the government of Massachusetts, the government of these states is all going to be on the, based on the consent of the governed, how they're going to be represented, um, how are the people represented, what's that going to look like, who, who's going to be able to vote. You know this. Of course, then, like I said, that sets us up for the federal constitution in 1787 um, as well. You know, uh, you know, George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison are all going to be involved in, in, say, Virginia's constitution. So we get to the point where there's this movement then for a new federal constitution. And you think, okay, the states have got their constitutions. Then by 1788, we have this new federal constitution ratified. Um, and you think, okay, that's going to be it. Okay, we'll amend. You know, we've amended, what, 27 times now, the federal constitution. These state constitutions will be amended. But it didn't end there. It didn't end there. Between 1790 and 1850, every state held a constitutional convention. They're all, they just kept making constitutions constantly. And Tom will talk later, I think, about Arkansas's, you know, constant for a while revision or changes of constitutions. Now, so these folks thought about and rethought about government and people's rights uh, through all of this. You know, some of them held more than one constitutional convention. You know, there comes a time when, you know, Americans by the early 19th century or in the mid 19th century, every time they form any kind of organization, any time they decide to get up a group and they're going to move west, they create a government. 
to do that. We think about that Western expansion later on. Every time they were meeting in Independence, Missouri, they all got together. They're electing a captain who's going to lead them. And they even decided how, if they needed to replace a captain, they were going to do that. They created sort of these many governments. It's not surprising when they're creating constitutions all the time. You know, all of this is a legacy from that revolutionary generation. Is how they keep doing this. I just believe it's you know their role to create government, recreate government. Yeah, and these state constitutions, the voters chose the delegates, and of course everybody knew that they were going to be reshaping the political institutions. They were going to be reshaping or rethinking people's rights. And unfortunately, sometimes these state constitutions took away some people's rights. Um, even though we think about this sort of being always kind of a constant expansion of rights. New Jersey had not limited the right to vote to men. Women were allowed to vote until 1812 when they realized that women actually apparently were trying to vote, and they stopped that. Um, up until the 1830s, a lot of states, especially in the North, were allowing free Blacks to vote, free Black men to vote. But in the 1830s, a lot of states started limiting that again. And Pennsylvania basically turned around and denied the right to vote to black men, which caused all sorts of um, protests um, throughout the 1830s. The other big thing that was happening was really an end to the property right uh, or the property uh, requirements for voting. Um, after 1790, one state after another started knocking those down. Um, New states who admitted to the union often did not require any property to vote. They just all, all right from the beginning, they were doing that. So that means in this early republic, 1790 and the 1820s, there's a significant change from that colonial and revolutionary eras. There's a rethinking about government. There's a rethinking about democracy and how many people can be part of um can be part of this political process. By 1860, there are only a few remaining barriers. A few states had kind of small barriers, sometimes on local issues, not necessarily even statewide issues. Um, that. Uh, now, that brings us to um, that brings us to Arkansas. This is the context for Arkansas when Arkansas becomes a territory um, in 17, or excuse me, 17, in 1819. There's already this history there of what rights are there, who gets to vote, how the government's set up, how a territory is set up, all these things. So Americans who moved to the Arkansas Territory held certain expectations about what that should mean in that territory, what their rights should be, whether they could vote or not. Many of them expected to participate in that territorial government, even if, you know, some of them might not be able to, but they, there was an expectation there. You know, and the territorial government, though, wasn't for them the last thing. That didn't give them a full right to participate in government because the territorial government only has so much control and so much power. The people in that territory only have so much control and so much power. To have the ultimate goal, to have full political rights is for statehood. Um, so they all knew that they had to start working toward that. And you know, Tom will talk to you a little bit about how the group that really started the movement uh, towards statehood on that. Um, yeah, so the goal is statehood and their full political rights then in once statehood happens. Um, on March 2nd, 1819, the, the territory is established by Congress, um, creating the offices of governor and secretary that are both appointed, not elected. And by the president, you do the usual nomination process, and the, the, you know, the Senate confirms them. They uh, decide on three judges who would be created, basically three judgeships who would serve basically as the first legislature to kind of help get things started. But again, all sort of um, created, not voters, not any political rights there at the moment. So I'm on that. James Miller is appointed as the first governor. As many of you know, Robert Crittenden is the first secretary and the man who will dominate much of Arkansas territorial politics for a decade. 
including shooting one of our territorial delegates in the process. So apparently he changed his mind about a lot of people a lot of times. So. But Crittenden worked with those three judges then to set up the laws and the government for the territory. And no surprise, then, the people that those the voters will elect are a territorial delegate to Congress. So Arkansas has somebody there representing it. But a non, of course, as we know, even still with some of the territories of the United States, or all of them, that they have a non-voting delegate to Congress. A five-member legislative council was established representing the five counties. And then a nine-member House of Representatives. So there, sort of the legislature starts to take effect, what these Americans would expect to happen and things that they would expect to vote for. And over time, other offices will be created, some appointed, some would be elected. But all these Americans who'd have been trained, had the experience of voting rights, had the experience of, of a, an expanding democracy, you know, a contested democracy more, we should say, um, now had that chance in Arkansas. And, you know, think if you're at the beginning on this, that it's your chance to sort of make a whole new government, really. You've got a lot of models here, but you don't have to go exactly with those models in doing that. As I said, this is contested citizenship and democracy in many ways. Because this movement toward democracy in the Arkansas Territory um, was expected, but it's incomplete. Um, they know that they that statehood's only going to uh, give them or guarantee them those full political rights. Um, they know that not everybody gets a chance to vote here. You know, we're still talking about we're not allowing women to vote, so that's half the population there. The other thing that's happening in the eighteen twenties kind of it completely at odds here with what's happening as the territories created is that of course we're going to expel the Quapaws from this state. The Cherokees who moved in for a short time, we're going to try to move them along into the Indian Territory as well. But that, of course, for so many people, the belief was the Quapaws, other Native Americans, had to move out of the territory for it to become a state. It couldn't really grow into becoming a state with Native Americans still here. And at the same time, we're moving in a whole other group of people who are going to be enslaved. And are there in a time when so many people in the revolutionary era thought slavery might be over by this time, or at least is going to be dying out. Instead, it's expanding, and it will expand for the next 30 years, 40 years in Arkansas. So in so many ways, while we're seeing this movement toward more voting rights for some and this territory becoming part of the union and about to become a state, we also see so many people being marginalized by that same government. And of course, you know, this territory was born in the midst of a national debate about slavery and that Missouri Compromise. So I'll just finish up here. One of the things about all this is, you know, it's an aspiration for democracy as much as anything, um, and maybe voter rights for so, so many people. Um, democratic governments don't always have to include a protection of rights and a constraint on government. That's not a requirement just for a democracy. A democracy can very much exclude or oppress minority groups, political or ethnic groups. Sometimes you'll hear people call that an illiberal democracy. You know, and so in so many ways, the de declaration is aspirational because it doesn't, even if it talks about equality and so many of these rights, that it doesn't quite get us there. The Constitution, of course, even itself doesn't guarantee voting rights. Um, talk about securing a Republican form of government. But nowhere is there a general uh, right to vote in the Constitution. 15th Amendment will say that you can't deny it based on race. There's no other. We know women are excluded, you know, and people of color are excluded from that, from those voting rights. Um, and for them especially, the words of the Declaration are very much aspirational, but they are ideas that they will continue to use decade after decade to push this state and the nation to be more inclusive democracy. That's my part. Thank all of you for being here. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, uh, while Tom is getting ready to uh, start his presentation, uh, we do have a couple of 
uh, comments and a request in chat. Uh, Lisa said, I was under the understanding that it took the 15th Amendment for all citizens, men, um, could vote regardless of property ownership. You have anything to uh, add or share about that? Well, most, like I said, most of the states had, had ended their property requirements, but of course, that's again for white men. Um, but they had ended for the most part. There may have been a few, like I said, a few barriers in some states are kind of minor, but for the most part, they'd all pretty much tossed out that idea of property qualifications. And of course, you can see why they're doing it. They're sort of kind of doing this to bring all white men into the political process and sort of, you know, in, in sort of in some ways, racial solidarity on that and maybe gender solidarity to some extent on that, too. So the right to vote for African-Americans comes along the 15th Amendment. Uh, those barriers are gone for them as well. Doesn't mean they're not going to come back because in the late 19th century, we're going to see we're going to see all sorts of new kind of barriers, of course, in the early 20th century, all sorts of new barriers that will come up to prevent some people from voting. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, Christina has said, uh, it's interesting that having a significant indigenous population could be a roadblock for statehood. Could you say a little more about that, please? Well, I think there are two things. When it comes to the Quapaws especially, there are two things here. One is a lot of people could see Arkansas with <clears throat> not having a very big population as being very much a frontier space. And so, in other words, in their mind, a lot of it not civilized. So as long as that Native American presence was there and a significant presence in some parts of the state or the territory, they would see that as being a barrier to more people wanting to move in. The other issue is the Quapaws live and, you know, kind of bound where, where Pine Bluff was, the Arkansas River, which is really good land for growing a certain crop. And a lot of other crops. So the crop balls have shown really well that, that uh, that's very good agricultural land. So that land is also needed if people wanted to, they wanted to promote the territory and the state for growth. They needed to have those areas that were going to be good agricultural land uh, available to new settlers as well. Okay. Uh, Joe, on that same note, um, did the, the manifest destiny concept have a lot to do with that as well, thinking that the push towards the West was, I, I hate to put it in such blunt terms, but, you know, the God-given right of the white man to conquer these lands. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I yeah, mean, right. so if anybody else was there, it didn't matter. Right. Yeah, that's right. And of course, you know, a lot of Arkansas, um, there's not a lot of, by the 1820s, there's not a lot of Native American settlement throughout Arkansas. So there's a lot of land that's sort of available to them without, you know, Native Americans there. So so a lot of folks who are not going to be bringing any uh, enslaved people with them who are going to move in uh, just to see that there's this, all this new land is a possibility. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Joe before we move on to Tom? If you think of any, as the night wears on, just be sure and put them in the chat and we'll get to them when Tom's finished with his presentation. So Tom, take it away. Thank you. I wanna thank Jamie and Ann for asking me to be a part of this. And of course, it's always a pleasure to share a stage with Joe Key, who's one of the real bright lights in the history community in Arkansas. Uh, I want to emphasize something that Ann said at the beginning. I, I don't want people to feel like I'm coming out of some kind of ivory tower as a college teacher to talk to, to public school teachers. <clears throat> I was a substitute teacher, a student teacher, a teacher, a coach, and finally a principal in the public schools. It's just to say, I, 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 I know I've been where you are. I well, you lost them at principal, though, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> you lost them when you said you were a principal. Well, it, so. it lost myself at principal. Uh, four, four years I'd rather forget but uh, I, I, I know where you are and I, I respect what you do uh, there's a lot of ways people can serve their community and their state and their nation be a fireman or a policeman or whatever I happen to think there's no more important way to serve your community than as a, as a teacher you know, the impact you have on young lives can't be matched by anything anyone else does so uh, if I can Get my screen up here. Good. We're good. Okay. Uh, 
Joe, a lot of what Joe said uh, dealt with the, the national scene. I want to talk uh, more about what's going on in Arkansas in the, in the statehood, early statehood period and bringing it up to the present. Uh, and at times, of course, Arkansas and the national scene will, will, will run together. <clears throat> but in the late territorial period, there's a faction of people in Arkansas who want Arkansas to become a state. This guy, William Savin Fulton, was not one of those people. And he was a very influential person. He was the last territorial governor of Arkansas. Uh, the argument for statehood, would it, it would give us, as one person said, the rights and privileges to which we are entitled. But Fulton understood, and he was probably right about this, that Arkansas was really not prepared financially to accept statehood. When you're a territory, the federal government pays your administrative costs, your internal improvements. But when you become a state, you assume those things for yourself. And he just did not think the time was right for Arkansas to become a state in 1836. <clears throat> Now, he was uh, joined in that opinion by this guy, uh, Ambrose Severe. Ambrose Severe is a part of that uh, group of men related by blood and by marriage who came to dominate Arkansas politics in the years between statehood in 1836 and the outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, Severe's, Conway's, Johnson's, made up what came to be called the family or the dynasty. Severe had married the daughter of the man on the left here, Benjamin Johnson, who was a territorial judge in Arkansas and later a federal judge in Arkansas. Uh, Benjamin Johnson was a brother of Richard Mentor Johnson, the man in the middle. Uh, Richard Mentor Johnson had become uh, something of a, a celebrity in the War of 1812. He was the man who allegedly, allegedly, fired the shot that killed the great Shawnee chieftain Tecumseh. And he built a political career around that. Uh, Richard Mentor Johnson had aspirations to be vice president of the United States in 1836. And the Johnsons and the Severs and the Conways believed that if Arkansas could become a state and thereby get electoral votes, they could help Richard Mentor Johnson succeed in that. Uh, as it turns out, he does end up becoming vice president of the United States under Martin Van Buren. And then the man on the far right, of course, everyone recognizes Andrew Jackson. <clears throat> the family, this group of related men, were strong Jacksonian uh, Democrats. And they thought as if they became a state, they would have more power to uh, assist Jackson uh, in his political aims. But there was another factor. And this may have outshone all the rest. Uh, and that was the issue of slavery. This map shows, well, this map really shows the United States in 1819. Several interesting things about this. You'll notice the Arkansas Territory, Arkansas with a W on the end, in 1819, included much of present day Oklahoma. Uh, the area up there where Illinois and Indiana and Ohio are, <laughs> by the terms of the Northwest Ordinance, slavery had been prohibited there. But when Missouri, asked for admission to the Union as a state, it asked for admission to the Union as a slave state. Uh, Missouri's, it was eventually admitted as a slave state. It was balanced, and now this may be off the edge here. Uh, it was balanced by the admission of Maine from the far Northeast as a free state, as a part of what came to be called the Missouri Compromise. <clears throat> the Missouri Compromise also stipulated that in the remainder of the Louisiana Territory, what on this map is called the Missouri Territory, in the remainder of that territory, 36 degrees, 30 minutes north latitude would be the dividing line between slave and free. Of 
course, that's our northern border and Missouri's southern border. So with the exception of Missouri, anything else that applied for admission to the Union north of that line would be a free state. Anything south of that line, which but it wasn't much south of that line. Remember, this is only the Louisiana Territory, not this area of the Spanish Southwest. <clears throat> so Arkansas will apply for admission as a slave state. Now, the Missouri Compromise had also set a precedent that since Congress was balanced between free and slave states in the Senate, that any, any state requesting to come in as a slave state needed a corresponding free state to be admitted at about the same time. And word had reached Arkansas that Michigan, the Michigan Territory, was also preparing to request admission to the Union as a state. Michigan, of course, was a free territory. It would be a free state. And this is what changed Ambrose Severe's mind. Go back to him. Severe had, uh, as I said, opposed statehood in 1836. But the major consideration for him was the fact that if Arkansas did not jump in now, in 1836, it might be another 10, 20 years before there was another free territory wanting to come in as a, as a free state to balance off Arkansas. And so he changed his tune, changed his mind, became an ardent supporter of statehood in 1836, and that helped turn the tide uh, for statehood. Arkansas enters the Union in 1836 as a, uh, free, as a slave state, balanced by the admission of uh, Michigan as a free state. And it would, in fact, be another 10 years before another free territory requested admission at Iowa in 1846. So for all these reasons, uh, the political powers that be became united behind the movement for statehood. Now, this being a group of teachers, it would not be right if we did not have a pop quiz. <clears throat> so I'm gonna ask you four questions here. This is a grade your own work. And there's no way you can fail. So start out with this one. How many, how many constitutions has the state of Arkansas had? How many constitutions have we had in our history? Quiz question number two, the state constitution that we are currently operating under was adopted in what year? Quiz question number three, which constitution gave African-Americans the right to vote? In other words, the constitution that was passed in what year gave African-Americans the right to vote? And finally, and I said, this is sort of a trick question. Which constitution gave women in Arkansas the right to vote? And keep those four questions in mind as we, go, as we go along. Well, with the move for statehood in 1836, uh, you had to have a state constitution before you could, you could uh, be admitted as a, as a state. Uh, and the first constitution of Arkansas was submitted on January the 4th, 1836. It was written on longhand, written in longhand. It took eight pages. Now, if you've looked at a current constitution, that's not much. As a matter of fact, some sources say four pages front and back, <clears throat> but written in longhand, there's a section of it over there on the right. <clears throat> Interesting story about this. Once the constitution had been written and approved, it had to be transmitted to Washington, DC. And it was considered to be a great honor to be the person who got to convey the new constitution to the nation's capital. And the man chosen was a guy named uh, Charles Fenton Mercer Nolan. That may ring a bell with some of you. He was a very, <coughs> uh, fairly popular writer in the, in the, uh, the Southwestern Humor School, also a lawyer. And uh, Nolan was given the, the, uh, the honor of taking the Constitution to Washington, D.C. Uh, just as a backup, they put a copy in the mail. Well, Nolan was very wary of storms. And so he took a very indirect route from Arkansas to the nation's capital to avoid those storms. And by the time he arrived, he found that the <clears throat> version of the Constitution that had been put in the mail had already reached the capital. So that took a little of the, of the uh, of the honor out of the uh, 
of the uh, selection. The first Arkansas Constitution of 1836 was brief, flexible, more closely modeled after the U.S. Constitution than other Arkansas Constitution would be. There were no salaries set. Uh, slavery was recognized. Uh, emancipation re required the consent of the owner of the slave. The governor, the legislators, county officials were elected by the people. Secretary of State, auditor, treasurer, supreme and circuit court judges selected by the legislature. Governors who would serve four-year terms had to be at least 30 years old and state residents. Now, what were the qualifications for voting under this first constitution? This is Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution of 1836. And it reads, every free white male citizen of the United States who shall attain the age of 21 years and a resident of this state for six months shall be deemed a qualified elector and entitled to vote. Now let's look at that. There are five qualifications mentioned there. Free, which eliminated African-American slaves. White, male, 21, citizen of the state for six months. No property or literacy requirements. But I'm going to go back to one and two. If you said free, white seems sort of redundant. Weren't all the African-Americans in the state slaves? Well, no, they weren't. Uh, there were not a large number, but a few who were called in the census records, they're called free persons of color. Uh, in 1820, there were 59 in the 1820 census. Uh, the, the Gazette uh, took a poll. Uh, there's a, I'm sorry, the territorial census in 1835, which revealed 176 free persons of color. By 1840, it gone to 465 to 1850 to 608. And in 1858, that's not a census year, but the Gazette had commissioned a, a, a census of its own, which revealed there were 734 free persons of color in Arkansas in 1858. So the number is small, but it's growing. But then you look at 1860, and it's down to 144. Well, what happened? It's actually Act 151 of 1859 banned the residency of free African-Americans or mixed-race mulatto people anywhere within the boundaries of Arkansas. <clears throat> and Governor Elias Conway signed this bill in February of 1859, saying that all Black people, all free Black people, had to leave the state by January 1, 1860, or face being sold into slavery for a period of one year. <clears throat> Other states had considered something like this, but Arkansas was the first to adopt such a measure. And maybe with a little hindsight, a little second thought, uh, reconsidered and, and say, well, let, let's, let's make it January 1, 1863. <clears throat> well, as we all know, some several momentous events are going to intervene before then. <clears throat> but what other momentous event takes place on January the 1st, 1863? Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. In, in, in effect, freeing all slaves in states still in rebellion against the United States. Of course, in 18, uh, uh, 1861, Arkansas holds a secession convention. Several states are already out of the Union or declared themselves out of the Union by then. The convention met on the 4th of March the same day that Abraham Lincoln took the oath of office as president. And it was divided. Uh, delegates from the North and the West generally opposed leaving the Union. Delegates from the South and East generally favored it. And delegates from the North and West had a small minority, uh, had a small majority, I'm, I should say, of about 37 to 35 over the ones from the South and East. And on every measure that came up, proposing that Arkansas secede, they were voted down. So the March convention, convention to consider secession <clears throat> fails to take the state out of the union. Uh, this man, David Walker from Washington County was a unionist. <clears throat> he was no doubt pleased with that result, <clears throat> but then something happens. And that something is that in April of 1861, Confederate forces in Charleston attack Fort Sumter. President Lincoln issues his call for troops 
to put down the rebellion, including troops from Arkansas. And now Arkansas is forced to make a choice. <clears throat> Another convention assembles. Uh, it assembles in May. And by an initial vote uh, with only five dissenters, uh, it votes to take Arkansas out of the Union and into the Confederacy. There was a call for unanimity. Uh, and uh, all but one delegate voted for secession. And you'll note now we've, we've had a change on the qualification of voting. Article three of the new constitution of 1861, every free white male citizen of the Confederate States of America who shall have attained the years 21 years and a citizen for six months can vote free, white, male in the 1861 Constitution. All right. This is the Confederate Constitution. By 1864, the war has not gone well for the Confederates in Arkansas. Uh, and Little Rock has now fallen to Union forces the previous year. And so the, uh, the loyal people in Arkansas, the unionists in Arkansas, <clears throat> gather to create a new constitution. This will be now the third, right? Uh, it was written on vellum, which vellum was originally, it's, it's kind of parchment, originally made from calf skin. It's nine pages long, yet not very long. Uh, Adopted on January the 19th, 1864, ratified in March of that year. This was an election that was supervised by federal troops. It provided for a unionist state government in Little Rock, while the old Confederate government, which had been in Little Rock, has now <clears throat> fled down to Washington and Hempstead County, down in Washington, for me, that part of the world, or Hope, Arkansas. So you've got two competing state governments, one in Little Rock, one in Washington. The Constitution of 1864 was a requirement uh, set by President Lincoln under what was called the 10% plan that any state in rebellion against the government could be reunited with the Union when 10% of the people that voted in 1860 Can't took vote. an oath of allegiance, pledged to abide by the Emancipation Proclamation. That is to recognize that slavery had been abolished. They could then that draft delegates to revise the state constitution and establish the new state government. That's what the new the constitution of 1864 is. Now I found this surprising. So it's a unionist government. Slavery, we recognize now in this constitution, slavery is abolished. And yet, what are the requirements for voting? in the Unionist Constitution of 1864. Every free white male, citizen of the United States, 21. It hasn't changed substantially from the Constitution of 1836, still did not incorporate African-Americans. Had to recognize slavery was abolished, repudiate secession, but did not divine define the rights of former slaves would enjoy. They were not included as voters, even in this Union's Constitution of 1864. Well, by the end of the war in 1865, now by 1868, with numerous former Confederates disfranchised, unable to vote, and the Republican Party, Unionist Republican Party in control in Arkansas, they write another Constitution in 1868, and I must say, this is by far uh, the best illustrated of the constitutions we've had. That's very, very good artwork there. <clears throat> but this Reconstruction Constitution is going to change things dramatically. Arkansas reenters the Union in 1868. Uh, this new constitution is, rat is ratified. Racial discrimination is illegal. The quality of all persons before the law, no more free, white, male, all persons before the law can't be deprived of any right, privilege, or immunity, nor exempted uh, on account of race, 
color or previous condition. That is on the fact you'd previously been a slave. It undertakes to provide support for public education and for a state university. Uh, and Little Rock somehow manages to fumble the ball and the state university ends up in Fayetteville. Uh, so it required the new Confederate, the former Confederate states to create new constitutions that allowed adult African-American males to vote. Uh, it also greatly enhanced the power of the state government, especially the governor. The governor was gave, given uh, really strong, broad powers in this constitution of 1868. Now, this is also in that constitution, <clears throat> confers full power on the federal government to maintain and perpetuate its existence and whensoever any portion of the states or people thereof attempt to secede from the federal union, forcibly resist the execution of laws, the federal government may uh, compel obedience to its authority. In other words, that's repudiating secession. <clears throat> now, what are the qualifications for voting? And here we have really the first change since the first constitution. We're now what? <clears throat> We're now... Uh, four constitutions in, and it's this one that now says every male person born in the United States or a male who's been naturalized is legally declared intention to become a citizen, 26. Every male, no more free, every male, every male person. Women are still getting screwed. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not over yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, by 1874, there's been a split in the Republican Party in Arkansas into two wings. And in 1874, the so-called Redeemers, and is the old conservative Democratic Party, has retaken control of the state government. And they write the fifth, and as you may know, the final constitution for the state of Arkansas. This is the constitution that we are still operating under today. Uh, it did several things. One thing, it dramatically weakened the power of the governor's office. It shortened his term. Uh, what it did not do, however, what it did not do is make any attempt to disfranchise African-Americans. There was still a fear that if they tried that, the federal government would intervene and take control of the government. <clears throat> so uh, there's no attempt to go back. And I should point out here, it's interesting to know that uh, we sometimes tend to think, well, you had the Civil War, you get slavery, and you had a Civil War. And then you go right into Jim Crow segregation. But really, that's not the case. The famous Arkansas-born historian C. Van Woodward in a book called The Strange Career of Jim Crow, Jim Crow just meaning legalized segregation, talks about the fact that there is a period between the end of the Civil War and the 1890s when the line between the races is much more hard to distinguish. Racial relations are much more fluid. You have, you, you've had after 1868 constitution of African-American legislators, uh, in the Arkansas legislature, and we'll you have they'll have a few until about 1890. <clears throat> so this doesn't try to go back in time to that. They know they can't do that. <clears throat> well, I see a number of women out there. Uh, quality of all persons below the law should ever remain inviolate. Uh, okay. Qualifications of voting in the Constitution of 1874. Every what male citizen of the United States, 21, in the state 12 months, in the county where they vote six months. And this is our last constitution, okay? We're still operating under it. It's been amended, but we're still operating under it. What about women? Now I saw uh, one of them, Kathleen, I think it was, had a shirt on, said votes for women. Uh, well, we're getting there. Well, we're not going very fast. And my wife gets angry every time we talk about this. Uh, an Arkansas law proposing women's suffrage was initially introduced at the Constitutional Convention of 1868. 
but it did not become a part of the document. And if you read about this, there are there are uh, accounts that say there's, there were several men who were brave enough to 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 advocate for it, but it says that the rest of the men in the in the in the, in the chamber laughed at them, made fun of. Them. So nothing in 1868. 1888, Claire McDermott, a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which had been founded in 1874, and his goal was obvious, of course, to, to do away with the sale and, and, and consumption of demon rum, but will become a very potent force in also trying to promote women's suffrage. Claire McDermott organized the Arkansas Equal Suffrage Association in Little Rock in 1888, but she died 11 years later and the AESA without her leadership soon went away. By 1911, and there, there, there are, I'm, I'm skipping some time here, but there are other uh, attempts to promote women's suffrage. Nothing ever comes up. By 1911, suffrage is organized again. So 75 women organized the Political Equality League whose goal was to, quote, secure equal suffrage uh, for women, 1911. <laughs> this is an article from the Democrat Gazette. <clears throat> There's a guy who is a staunch segregationist uh, named James K. Vardaman, who's a governor of Mississippi. <clears throat> he spent a lot of his time trying to get the 15th Amendment repealed. <clears throat> but he also was strongly opposed to women's suffrage. This is an article. Uh, in the Gazette, Little Rock suffragists can contradict Senator Varner, Vardaman. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I don't know if you can read, make much out there. <clears throat> Vardaman had argued <clears throat> uh, that if you let women vote, then you have to let black women vote. And if women started voting, black and white women started voting together, they'd vote <clears throat> often with black men, <clears throat> and that was just something we couldn't have. Also, he had said that women who voted would not be as, as womanly uh, if they were allowed to vote. Uh, and if you go down here into the second paragraph where it says, under, we'll still be good wives. <clears throat> uh, you can read this. You know how, you know, it is funny how we women who are acting in the suffrage movement are misunderstood by the men. They need not uh, be least afraid of us. We would. Uh, we would not hurt them for anything. Neither do we intend to usurp their places in the world, as some men seem to think. We only want to help them and share some of their responsibility. In the next paragraph, women will be just as womanly, will make just as good wives and sweethearts and as good mothers after they are granted the suffrage as before. Pretty good stuff. The movement for women's suffrage met strong opposition from the liquor interest in the state. As I said, by this time, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who were hated by the liquor interest in the state, had become closely associated with the movement for women's suffrage. And the, the liquor interest uh, contended that women, quote, should not be contaminated with politics and that they belonged in the home. And so the proposed amendment of April 12, 1911, failed. Here's a picture of Adolphine Fletcher Terry and her sister Mary. They were both prominent suffragists. Uh, and she's from a very prominent family, of course, and, and used that uh, for the, in a campaign for social change, for civil rights, for education. This is a picture of her in about 1910 from the Central Arkansas Library's Encyclopedia of Arkansas. 1915, still haven't got to vote. The Political Equality League joined with the Arkansas Federation of Women's Clubs, uh, advocated a women's suffrage resolution. Once again, it was proposed for the Arkansas Constitution. Florence Cotton, I'm pictured here, addressed the House, and the amendment passed. We're gonna get, to, we're gonna get women's vote in, 20, in 1915, right? Well, no, it's, it's Arkansas. No, we're not. Well, and this is still a, a part of the law. Only three amendments can be considered 
any year by the by the uh, by the legislature and the people. Four were proposed. Guess which one got dropped? The women's suffrage amendment failed again to make the cut, and so women are frustrated again in 1915. In 1916, the suffragists brought in some heavy hitters from the national stage. Alice Paul on the left, Carrie Chapman Catt on the right, both came to Arkansas to campaign for women's suffrage in 1916. Now this is a this is a, this is a later time, but this would have been commonplace this time. This is a this is a WCTU banquet in Little Rock in 1930, and here's a WCTU float in a parade in 19 see prohibition on the on the uh, front of the boat there. Success at last. Uh, well, well, partial success at last. With the movement still growing in popularity, February 7th, 1917, State Representative John A. Riggs of Hot Springs, a very courageous man, introduced in the Arkansas House a women's, pri a women's primary suffrage bill. It allowed women to vote in party primary elections. I'll come back to that in a minute. The Arkansas House voted favorably, and the Senate, by an overwhelming majority of 17 to 15, also voted in favor. Governor Charles Bruff noted he favored the enfranchisement, considered an honor to sign the measure. And finally, a women's suffrage bill passed and made Arkansas the first non suffrage state in the Union to permit women to vote in primary elections. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot. But you have to remember that by the 1890s, there have been a series of, of laws enacted that are going to greatly decrease the African-American vote, poll taxes, literacy clauses, grandfather clauses. So the African-American vote drops dramatically after the 1890s. And by the time this, this passes in 1917, there really is only one party in Arkansas, that's the Democratic Party. So the, the uh, primary, the Democratic primary was really tantamount to election. I can remember growing up in a small town in Southwest Arkansas and on the night of, of the Democratic primary, the courthouse grounds would be filled with people and they would come out and announce the results as they came in. And there would people be vendors selling food and drink. On the night of the general election in November, there'd be nobody at the courthouse. To win the Democratic primary was tantamount to being elected. So getting to vote in a primary was a pretty big deal uh, for Arkansas women. And here's a women's suffrage rally on the steps of the state capitol, celebrating the passage of that primary bill. And there's Governor Bruff standing in the front row there, uh, wearing a black tie and a white jacket off to the right bottom there. And here are the heroes of the day. Representative John Riggs of Garland County of Hot Springs and Governor Charles Bruff. Bruff was a progressive and he would continue to promote progressive measures. Uh, now, the next movement, of course, now you've got the vote in the primaries where we go from there. In early 1917, the Arkansas Women's Suffrage Association reorganized and became the Arkansas Equal Suffrage Central Committee, AESCC, to teach women how to work with political parties, methods of agitation, and uh, such as that. Because World War I now is going to start in 1917. In the statewide primaries in 1918, more than 40,000 women voted, and there were 50 female delegates elected to the Democratic State Convention, which included a women's suffrage plank and endorsed, quote, unlimited suffrage for women and supported a federal women's suffrage amendment. Uh, during 1918, another attempt was made to include women's suffrage in a proposed constitution, but the constitution failed to receive a majority. So there's several attempts to write new constitutions after 1874, none of them ever succeed. <clears throat> and there's the governor again in his second term. In his inaugural address, he endorsed the women's suffrage amendment to the Arkansas Constitution, as well as the ratification of the federal suffrage amendment. And in June 19, the, the, the National Congress passed the federal women's suffrage amendment, 
and submitted it to the states for ratification. Only a mere 83 years after Arkansas had become a state are women given the right to vote. Now, now it, once the Congress passed it, now the, the three-fourths of the states have to ratify it. And so you have to have a special assembly to ratify the amendment. Again, Florence Cottenham and members of the AESCC started writing letters. And many of the, uh, the, the uh, people in the assembly were enthusiastic, promised to be there and vote. And they did. Uh, it pa they passed Arkansas by a vote of 74 to 15 in the convention, making Arkansas the 12th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. <clears throat> women fill the Capitol carrying yellow banners, reading votes for women. <clears throat> Kathleen, I think that's what your shirt said. <clears throat> 19th Amendment becomes law August the 26, 1920. And here's what it is. Very, it's very brief and to the point. The right of citizens to, of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Well, you would think that would do it. Now everyone's been included. But the fact of the matter is there continue to be challenges to voting rights. And we've seen a lot of this in recent months, <clears throat> refusing to accept the results of free and fair elections, attempts to restrict the time and place of voting, attempt to restrict voting by mail, in 2021, last year, 19 states enacted 33 laws that will make it harder for Americans to vote. More than 425 bills with provisions that restrict voting access were introduced in 49 states. In two states, Montana and Arkansas enacted four laws restricting voting. I would actually argue Arkansas actually did more. What are we talking about now? Where has the battle gone now? Uh, here's a list of things. Uh, making mail voting and early voting more difficult. Uh, criminal laws to deter election officials uh, from engaging in ordinary lawful and essential tasks. <clears throat> it's a crime now to hand out water to people standing in line to vote in Georgia. Uh, Iowa and Kansas, people could face criminal charges for returning ballots on behalf of those who made any assistance. I remember I've done this for my mother when she was in the nursing home in a wheelchair. <clears throat> in Texas, always Texas, election officials could face criminal prosecution if they encourage voters to mail ballots. And most recently, Texas enacted SB1 that uh, made it more difficult for Black, Asian uh, Americans to vote or those who face language barriers. And there are others there. Number eight is particularly troubling. <clears throat> A couple of states have considered measures to allow the legislature or the Secretary of State to overrule the vote of the people. In other words, no matter what the results of the, of the election in the state, these measures would give the legislature or the Secretary of State the power to overrule. <clears throat> in Arkansas, uh, we're all familiar now with the voter ID, the photo ID, and I don't have a lot of problem with that. <clears throat> Act 728 restricts loitering within 100 feet of the main interest of polling site, <clears throat> unless you're waiting to vote. Act 736 changed the law on absentee ballots. You can't give more than, submit more than five absentee ballots. If you do, you're presumed to be engaged in voter fraud. Uh, Act 736, county clerks may make absentee ballot applications available online, but they may not send them to unsolicited voters. <clears throat> Act 973 moves up the deadline for delivering an absentee ballot in person. The close of business on Monday before the election to close business on Friday. <clears throat> Act 974 empowers the state board to decertify county election officials <clears throat> uh, and so on. Many of these restrictions have come in the in, in, in supposed response to voter fraud. The notion that there is widespread voter fraud. <clears throat> and I've in this research, and it's since 2002, 2002, six people in Arkansas have been convicted of voter fraud. Six. <clears throat> Nationally, in a 2020 presidential election, the Associated Press today uh, really exhaustive review of the six battleground states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. <clears throat> and they found uh, 475 documented cases of voter fraud out of a total of 25.5 million 
votes cast. <clears throat> that review also showed no collusion or intention to rig the voting. There were individuals acting along. <clears throat> uh, this is, this is, these figures are from Fortune magazine. There's the website if you want to check that out. Uh, the election clerk from Milwaukee County in Wisconsin said voting fraud is not is voter fraud is virtually non-existent. Uh, I would have to venture about the same odds of voting fraud as you're getting hit by light. Well, what can we conclude from all this? <clears throat> uh, the, the Irish order, John Philpot Curran said, the condition upon which God hath given liberty to man is eternal vigilance, eternal vigilance, <clears throat> which condition if he breaks servitude is at once the mix of his crime and the punishment of his guilt. And that's often paraphrased as uh, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. It's a, a statement that's, that's attributed to Thomas Jefferson. No evidence Jefferson ever said that, but it's often attributed to him. Uh, the sources, if you're interested in looking more into this, <clears throat> this wonderful resource we have, which I hope you're making uh, use of, uh, is the Central Arkansas Library Systems Encyclopedia of Arkansas online. It's a fabulous source. <clears throat> These two articles that I drew on in particular are from Kay Goss on Arkansas Constitutions. Very good little summaries of what the Constitutions did and Paula Kaiser Taylor on the women's suffrage movement in, in, in Arkansas. Uh, and all of, and the, most of the photos also came from the Encyclopedia of Arkansas History. So that's all I have. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Two wonderful presentations. Gosh, so good. All right. Well, Ann, would you like, since we don't have any questions at this time, you want to share some little bit of news? Be glad to. Thank you both again. Very good presentations. I think that gives us a good overview of the national perspective and the perspective in Arkansas and how voting rights progressed or not um, in, in the time period you were asked to cover. So if there's any questions about the Bending Towards Justice series, you can email me at aclements at arkansashumanitiescouncil.org. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, look for the registration uh, link should be up uh, on our website and on our social media as of today. It should be up and active so you can register for that immediately. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the chat, all of the lectures that are part of this Bending Towards Justice series will be available on the AHC's YouTube channel, so they'll be available for viewing uh, soon after the presentations are over with. So again, I appreciate y'all taking the time out of your busy start of the fall school year. Um, I know we're probably halfway through it by now, but I still want to call it the start of the fall school year with September, but reiterate what we always say, y'all are doing great work, and we so appreciate you, uh, so from me and all of us at the Humanities Council, thank you for everything that you are doing to create educated citizens, future <laughs> citizens uh, of Arkansas that can use critical thinking skills to make decisions that are gonna, are gonna affect all of our futures. If there's anything the council can do, don't hesitate to ask. And I, before we close, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Key and Dr. DeBlack. Thank you both so very much thank uh, you. for this evening. It has truly been a pleasure and uh, learned, I've already learned some new things too. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you both. And thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you back uh, next week. So uh, thanks so much and have a wonderful evening and a great weekend. Thanks, Bye. Jamie. Bye. 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 Bye.